Very simple. How did the cosmos begin and how will it end? Well, we think the universe began with a cosmic explosion 13.7 um, billion years ago. We know that number to within 1% accuracy. In well, fact. How do we know that? Well, we know the rate at which the universe is expanding. Uh, stars, for example, yellow light from stars is stretched because they're moving away from us. And they turn reddish as a consequence. That's called a Doppler shift. When a car moves toward you, for example, uh, the frequency is high. When a car moves away from you, the frequency is stretched or lowered. It sounds like this. Now, you've heard that all your life. But what is that? That's a Doppler effect. It also works for light beams. When yellow light comes toward you, it's bluish. When yellow light moves away from you, it's reddish. The redder it is, the faster it moves. So it's trivial to calculate the expansion of the universe. You simply look at the night sky and see how much the, the, the light is red shifted. Then you run the videotape backwards. We have this enormous, quote, videotape on computer of the expanding universe, so we run it backwards. You've all seen explosions run backwards on television. And then you get back to the point where the universe was a small little dot. That's how we know the universe began with a fiery explosion. And we can also pick up the afterglow of the Big Bang. When you get a radio and you turn it between stations, you get that static, that static. Believe it or not, a few percent of that static comes from the Big Bang itself. You are actually listening to Genesis on your radio. Your television set, when you have snow on your TV set, a few percent of that snow comes from the creation of the universe. Uh, more percent comes from planet Jupiter. Planet Jupiter also causes static on the Earth, which is more than the Big Bang. But we physicists have measured that microwave background radiation. We now have baby pictures, baby pictures of the infant universe. And you know what? It's an explosion. We have baby pictures of the explosion itself. And sure enough, it is a gigantic explosion, just like everyone thought. And we've actually not taken pictures of it in the microwave region. The big question is, how will the universe end? There are two ways it could end, in fire or ice. If it ends in ice, the universe keeps on expanding and gets colder and colder and colder. Or the universe could expand, stop, and then come back and get hotter and hotter and hotter in the big crunch. Either way, the laws of physics say we're doomed. <laughs> Either we're going to die in fire or die in ice. But there's one way out of this death. The question is, the laws of physics, are they a death warrant for all intelligent life? Most physicists would say yes, that inherent within physics is a death warrant for all intelligent life in the universe, because either the universe dies in ice as it expands or dies in fire as it contracts. I think there's a loophole. The loophole is that billions, trillions of years from now will be so advanced that as the universe dies, we will leave the universe. We will leave our bubble, have a lifeboat, and then go to another neighboring bubble and start all over again. So in other words, this theory of everything may ultimately be the theory of salvation for intelligent life in the universe. Now that's speculation. But in parallel worlds, I even give you the blueprint, the design, how much energy it would take to build a machine which would take us to a neighboring universe. And is that going to happen in the next week or so? No. <laughs> I wouldn't buy an insurance policy anticipating the death of the universe. We're talking about billions, trillions of years from now. We still debate exactly how it's going to happen. Right now, the data seems to favor the big freeze. The data seems to, to favor the fact that we will all freeze to death billions, trillions of years into the future. All right, we've got all sorts of callers on hold, and we're going to get to those right after this email. David Moshinsky, Claremont, Florida. My reading of M-theory and string theory indicates that there are an infinite number of universes. I recall from math studies that if there are an infinite number of universes, anything can happen, will happen, and will happen an infinite number of times. Well, even in the quantum theory, forget string theory, even in the quantum theory, our universe coexists with other parallel universes. So our universe is constantly splitting into different universes with different outcomes. Then comes the big question that everyone wants to know the answer to. 
is Elvis Presley still alive in one of these other universes? And the answer is, in some sense, yes. In some sense, our loved ones who have perished in our universe could be alive in another parallel universe. And then the question is, well, where are these parallel universes? And the answer is, they're in your living room. We coexist in the same space with these other universes. Now, Steve Weinberg, Nobel laureate, compares it this way. Think of radio. If I have a radio receiver and I turn to one frequency, you get a nice, clear musical signal. But in that same living room, you coexist with radio from all frequencies. You get Radio Havana, Radio Moscow, Radio Beijing. You get all these different frequencies right in your living room. You coexist with all frequencies, but your radio is tuned to just one frequency. In the same way, in your living room, there is the wave function of dinosaurs. In your living room, there's the wave functions of the loved ones that you, you cherished who are dead, but are still alive in a parallel universe. They're right in your living room, but we're not coherent. We're not tuned into them. Our frequency is different. Therefore, for all intents and purposes, we cannot communicate with them. So even in the ordinary quantum theory, the theory of lasers, the theory of optics, the theory of GPS, the internet, broadband, even in ordinary quantum mechanics, we have this infinite set of universes. Now string theory goes even farther and says these universes could be in higher dimensions and maybe protons and neutrons are not stable. So string theory has an even larger set of infinite universes. So what do we make of this? Our universe is rather stable. To go to a neighboring universe would require a technology far beyond anything that we can muster. So don't think you're going to wake up on Mars tomorrow. Don't think you're going to meet a dinosaur tomorrow. It's not going to happen. Michio Kaku is our guest. Butch from Jackson, Wyoming, you're first up. Go ahead with your question. It's a privilege. Uh, my mentor, who I'm not going to mention, uh, talked about different dimensions. He says that there is life on Mars, but and they see Earth as desolate and dead, as we see Mars, because they're in a different dimension and they see us from a different dimension. He says the, the inner universe would make the outer universe the size of a pinhead, and that the, there is something past the speed of light, and it's called a thought. I'd like to know what the uh, response to is that. Thank you. Well, Butch, you raise a lot of very interesting questions. Uh, first of all, can other beings exist in these other dimensions, these other universes? And the answer is yes. In fact, if you take a look at string theory, you take a look at ordinary quantum theory, the theory of 1925, that theory also makes this possible. However, and here's a catch, and it's a very big catch, communicating communicating between dimensions is extremely difficult. Most physicists would say impossible. I wouldn't go that far. I think it is possible, but extremely difficult with our technology. Now, on Mars, you mentioned the possibility of life. Well, in our universe, we see no evidence of life on Mars, not even microbial life. However, no one's ever looked underground maybe in the polar ice caps, maybe in the permafrost underground, maybe there are uh, evidence of intelligent life forms. However, none of our space probes have ever gone underground into the ice caps or into the permafrost. But even if there was a civilization on Mars, communication between us would be extremely difficult. It would require what we physicists call a type three civilizations technology, and we're basically a type zero civilization. So don't think we're gonna be able to communicate with other dimensions and with other beings anytime soon. What's a type zero civilization and are we near being a type one in your view? We physicists rank civilizations not by politicians and great men and great leaders. We rank them by energy. A type one civilization has mastered planetary energy. All the energy of the sun that falls on their planet, the weather, Earthquakes, volcanoes, they, they play with hurricanes. That's type one, like Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon. A type two civilization plays with stars. That's the next level of energy. And Star Trek and the Federation of Planets is just beginning to play with stars and nearby star systems. That would be a type two civilization. Then there's type three, galactic. 
they have harnessed the power of maybe a hundred billion star systems like Independence Day, uh, like Star Wars, like the Borg on Star Trek. Now on this scale, are we type 1 that control hurricanes? Are we type 2 that control star systems? Are we type 3 that roam the galactic space lanes? No, we're type 0. We get our energy from dead plants, oil and coal. But we can dream. In fact, if you take out a calculator, you can show that we are about 100 years away from being a type 1 civilization. And you see evidence of this everywhere I go. Uh, the internet, what is the internet? The internet is the beginning of a type 1 telephone system. So we're privileged to be alive to see the birth pangs of a type 1 civilization. What language will this type 1 civilization speak? Probably English. It is already the number one second language on the planet Earth, the language of science, commerce, art. If you take a look at uh, the economy, we're witnessing the beginning of a type 1 economy. The European Union. These nations have slaughtered each other ever since the ice melted 10,000 years ago, and now they're forming a single block. And why are they ganging together? To compete against us, NAFTA. So we're seeing the beginning of a type 1 economy. We're seeing the beginning of a type 1 culture with rock and roll. Uh, what is blue jeans? What is rock and roll? What is Chanel and, and uh, Louis Vuitton? The beginning of a type 1 culture. And there is a backlash. There are some people who don't like this transition to type 1. People who are fundamentalist, terrorists, for example, they prefer more, be more comfortable not 100 years in the future. They would rather be 500 years into the past. So we see the birth pangs of the beginning of type 1. And I personally think that is perhaps the greatest transition in the history of human civilization. From the fragmented, rather backward civilization of today, to a planetary civilization a hundred years from now. Next call, St. Petersburg, Florida. Gary, go ahead. Hey, guys. Um, Doc, I'm holding the book in my hand right now, Einstein's Ideas and Opinions. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's one paragraph. I want to, you to explain this to me, what he was driving at. It's only five sentences. But it says, in my opinion, the present manifestation of decadence are explained by the fact that economic and technologic developments have highly intensified the struggle for existence, greatly to the detriment of the free development of the individual. But the development of technology means that less and less work is needed from the individual for the satisfaction of the community's needs. A planned division of labor is becoming more and more of a crying necessity, and this division will lead to the material security of the individual. The security and the spare time and energy which the individual will have at his disposal can be turned to development of his personality. Um, in this way, the community may regain itself, and we will hope that future historians will explain the morbid symptoms of present-day society as the childhood ailments of an aspiring humanity due entirely to the existence, due to the entirely to the excessive speed at which civilization was advancing. All right, Gary, okay. what, do you, what would you like Dr. Kaku to respond to? What was he driving at there? That, All the, right, thank okay. you. Einstein at length wrote about the fact that technology is a double-edged sword. On one hand, technology gives us a division of labor. We're not simply nomads in a tribe wandering across the desert anymore. We're, we have layers. We have uh, leaders. We have craftsmen. Uh, we have farmers. We have a division of labor. And with that division of labor comes two things. A, inequity. That is, the disparity between the rich and the poor, the powerful and the weak. But on the other hand, progress medicine, energy, we no longer have to do back-breaking work. We can now span the oceans and span the globe and communicate with each other. So he was just mentioning the fact that science is a double-edged sword. The question is, which part of the sword will dominate? Is it the part that gives us a liberating society that's educated and scientific, or a society that's fragmented into hierarchies that are permanent and embedded into a system of inequity? So that's what he was getting at. And it's up to us. It's up to us to decide which way we'll go. And I think that ties in with what I said about a type 1 civilization. On one hand, we have the trend toward a type 1 civilization, scientific, multicultural, tolerant. But on the other side, a tendency toward fundamentalism and racism and sectarianism and terrorism. And it's not clear which of the two trends will eventually dominate.